Guria. I'm a bank for KCB Group. I'm also a member of the Women on Boards Network, and I serve in the Advocacy and Policy Committee. So allow me to just give a brief of Women on Boards Network. Um, I know we have members and unmembers in this session. So allow me to give a brief. Women on Boards Network is an initiative aimed at promoting and encouraging women into board leadership. The network provides a platform that will bring together women from diverse fields and ranks. Women on Boards facilitates those already sitting on boards uh, to effectively carry out their roles and responsibilities and upskill and prepare for boardroom. Those women who are already in senior leadership roles but are not yet sitting on any boards. So there's an opportunity when you're a member in Women on Boards to be to get opportunities to actually serve in different uh, boards because we get a lot of uh, uh, those opportunities in the, in, in the network. The initiative is all about ensuring that the next generation of board members is more diverse and better balanced from a gender perspective. We aim at putting the talents of women to work to improve the effectiveness of corporate boards now and in the future. This is in recognition that a number of women are sitting in boards is still very low. And, and, and if you look at the statistics, even globally, the number is low. The initiative therefore aims at encouraging and accelerating diversity on boards by ensuring that there is a pool of board ready women. And those women already sitting on boards have an avenue for networking and sharing experiences uh, with, with a view of becoming better directors and serving better in those boards. And the most important thing is that we have something called the quarteries and those quarteries you're able to ups, create, have, a, have smaller groups that you can create opportunities and share experiences. We also have the junior membership because we must agree diversity is not just about having more women. We also need to look at the youth. So we are, we are actually building that muscle as a network to ensure that we have a pipeline of young people and youth that are looking forward to also join boards uh, so that we can have actually a diverse board. The network is therefore targeting women from the following four categories. Women at the top management level, whose next level step is to be a board member, mentoring and training. Women currently serving as board members, development and sharpening of their skills, and as well as uh, helping them to better appreciate corporate governance because we have corporate governance training under the Women on Boards Network, which, which is done, which we've just finished one actually about this month. Women uh, newly appointed as board members. So we train and prepare them for the tasks ahead and for them to understand and appreciate their personal attributes and biases, which may hinder them from becoming um, effective board members. So it's important that we, we, we train as, as you join as a new board member, you're welcome to actually go through the support system under the Women on Boards Network. Then women whose uh, terms on boards have expired uh, to keep abreast with developments in the corporate governance so as to remain board ready to mentor, to encourage uh, the next generation of corporate women leaders. To take us through this session, I, I assure you you're the best person to take us through this <laughs> session. And I'm sure we'll have a great, a great time with you. But allow me to, to introduce Lina and um, just to, to share her profile. It's important, Lina, you listen to your profile. I know you, you, you know it, but it's, it's better when it's read out for you and we speak out and, and celebrate you as, as the great leader you are. Lina is currently the Managing Director of Kenya Wine Agencies uh, Limited, a subsidiary of Distel. Lina Gidduka is uh, an accomplished business professional whose career spans over 25 years, mainly in FMCG industry in various local and global roles. She has worked in London, South Africa, Uganda, as well as managed several markets across Africa. Her career began as a management trainee in Unilever, after which she joined British American Tobacco, where she worked for 16 years before joining Qual in 2017. Her core competencies include portfolio management, brand management, 
trade marketing, strategy development, business development, people leadership, and people leadership. She's passionate, committed to delivering business results, and is a proven people and business leader with strong interpersonal skills. She held several leadership roles with British American Tobacco and now Qual, contributing significantly to talent development. She has contributed to the success of each company she has worked in through her strong commercial acumen. In addition, Lina is a mentor with Greenhorn Mentorship Program at the University of Nairobi and the Global Give Back Circle. Lina was recently recognized as the lead on the top 25 most powerful women in the C-suit impacting business in 2021. Congratulations, Lina. This is not a, 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 a small award. We really applaud you for this. Thank you. Thank you. Lina's professional experiences to date span from uh, within the following organizations where she's worked. Lina is now the managing director of Qual. She's been a commercial director. She's been a commercial consultant at Qual. She's been, she's headed marketing. Um, she's been head of brands and you can see she's grown through the ranks between the, all through the company she's worked for. So Lina, um, for me is to welcome you today uh, to take us through this session. And, and, and I think just to start off, I think if, if, is, is the quotes, is, is just a few quotes. And, and one of them is, um, for you to find your inner strength, I was always looking you, I was always looking outside myself for strength and confidence, but it comes from within. It is there all the time. And I think Lina will take us through and she'll, she'll, she'll take us through this inner strength uh, session and, and, and I'm sure we'll all enjoy. And we welcome you to put any questions you have on the chat and we'll also have a Q&A after. Lina, welcome, take, take, take this. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Eunice, for the warm welcome. I applaud the Women on Boards Committee for the work that you're doing. I'm actually a member. Um, it is part, I'm part of those top leadership looking to enter boards. So joining the, the network was part of the first step. And I'm also currently doing the Women's Development um, Leadership Program at the uh, Strathmore uh, Business School. So it's part of the journey to get into boards. So, um, well done for the work that we've done. Uh, what Eunice did not tell you, and I always start when I introduce myself, is my most important role. And the one that gives me the most fulfillment is um, a mother to my lovely 13-year-old. So when I'm not managing qual issues, I am a mother and it's a full-time job and I think one that I love very much. Um, the other thing I should actually say at this point is... Um, when um, the, the, the committee approached me to talk, um, my first instinct was to say no. Um, for those who know me, and I think a few on the call will probably know me, I tend to want to keep a very low profile. But that said, I've come to realize that there is a role that I play as a woman leader. I'm reminded of a mentor that I had when I was in BAT. And he used to tell us, as women leaders, when we reach the top, we must make sure we send the elevator down to get other women. And we not only send the elevator down, we make sure that there are women who are ready to enter the elevator. So I guess this is me getting out of my comfort zone and doing what I have to do. Um, when I was um, trying to unpack um, the topic today, Inner Strength for Greatness, I reflected on how I will tackle it. Um, and in my true corporate way, allow me to share a screen to walk through some of the things that I will talk about today. Um, and I must say this is a topic that truly, truly does resonate with me. And as I give you my examples, you will realize why. Um, I must start by also saying, like many of you on the call, I am a woman of faith. So I believe that the favor um, that I experience and the inner strength that I have is actually because of God's grace. So I'm not going to go on a religious journey, but I thought it's important. I, I acknowledge 
the power of God's grace in the things that I accomplish and the strength that I have as an individual. So over and above the quote that, um, let me just, my screen seems to have frozen. Over above the, Yeah, over and above the quote that Eunice has talked about, for me, when I think of inner strength, this is a quote that resonates so strongly with me. Maya Angelou, I think we all know Maya Angelou, and the quote is, nothing can dim the light which shines from within. That light for me is the inner strength. Inner strength for me is the soul, is the strength of the soul, that core strength that we all have that is within us and inside us. And I'm a true believer, if you do believe that in your inner strength, you will succeed. The inner strength is what gives us determination, it what gives us tolerance, it what gives us resilience. And I'll get into the things that I have learned and what I have experienced because of my inner strength. The first one is resilience. Um, I, I say this humbly, but um, when asked about to describe myself, I do describe myself as a resilient person. Um, and I will give you a story later on why I say that. Resilience we all, is become such a buzzword today. I think in these COVID times, we're talking about resilient leaders, resilient teams, resilient organizations. And that's a skill set that you need to have today, especially to navigate in this volatile, uncertain market environment. But for me, resilient is about one's ability to survive and thrive in the face of adversity. Because the reality is women, and I think we all can attest to that, life will throw things at you. I think none of us can claim to have that perfect life. So we will be challenged, be it in your personal life, be it in your career. Uh, and I think how you react is, is based on the resilience that you have. And I'll give you my story on resilience. In June 26, June 26, 2003, I had an accident. It was a very freak accident. We were at a team building in BAT. Uh, we had gone for paintball. And after paintball, there was a rundown track that was in the same venue that we were doing the paintball and we still had time. So the team felt they wanted to go cut. So we started using the go-karts. It was evident that there were a bit faulty, a few crashes and the go-kart track was not well maintained. So unfortunately, when it was my time to get onto the go-kart, um, I tried to navigate one of the corners and the go-kart brakes totally failed. And because the track was not well maintained, the only thing that could stop me was a concrete wall. At that point, because of the force, um, I fractured my right leg just above my ankle. It not only fractured, it actually tore through my leg. And we were all the way in Rongai. So we had to travel uh, the long and short. I got operated at Nairobi Hospital, stayed there for three, for three weeks. And I went home to recuperate. Um, in um, in uh, when I was, you know, recuperating and I'd started putting weight on my leg, one day somewhere in October, I noticed that my leg was crooked. I went and I saw the doctor, and it was evident that the plates inside had broken. So what that meant was another operation. So on the 1st of November of the same year, 2013, 20, the 2003, I went in for another operation. Um, this time I was not about to give up on my crutches. I didn't want to, to be told about walking. I said, I'll start walking when I think I'm ready. And I only started walking, I think it was May of 20, 2004. Around that time, a lot was happening in the office. Um, I had joined BAT in 2000. I had been recognized, I was excelling, and I'd been earmarked as a high potential. 
That means if there's an opening for exposure in the UK, um, I was to take it. The team came from the UK, had conversation with me, a bit of an interview, and I was selected to join the international brand team in the UK. That was 2004. By then I thought I was fully recovered. I went to the UK in October, 2004. By 2005, it was evident that there was a problem with my leg. And after extensive um, review with doctors and if anyone has been to the UK, seeing a doctor is not easy. The first thing that was um, all the doctors, the three that I saw recommended reconstruction surgery. So I went through a process of very, very elaborate surgery. Let me put, when you are working in a head office in perspective, you are in the engine of the business. People who go to the head office go to prove themselves. That is where you go to prove yourself and get your next appointment. And it's a very competitive environment. It's a mini UN. You have brilliant, brilliant minds from all over the world. And especially for a company like BAT, who is truly a multinational. I must say, I have, um, a lot of you know uh, admiration for BAT because I, I I actually say who I am today is because of the experience that I had in BAT. The long and short is I started extensive surgery, went through three other surgeries in the UK, so I had to stop. I couldn't do the work I was there for. Um, when I went to the UK, I was about thirty three years old. I was single, so my mom came and stayed with me. After six months, she had to leave and I had to go back to work. For those again, who've been to the UK, you know the life there, there's no driver, there's no maid. And I had to navigate all that. I must say there were so many days I felt that I want to enter the first plane that, and go home. But I was, when I talked to myself, I knew that I had to do this because A, I was going through the best treatment that I would ever have had access to. I was being privately treated in the UK. And the reality was the kind of treatment that I was getting, there was no way I would have come and gotten the treatment home. So every day as I left the office on my crutches, went through the supermarket with my backpack, put my food inside, went and microwaved my food and stood there on my crutches and ate because you can't eat and walk away with your food because you're on crutches and there's no maid to help you. It was really, really tough. But it was in that experience that I truly discovered the power that I have inside me. And today, you know, such adversities actually make you realize the strength that you have. And the reality is I am not fearful today about adversity. I know I have what it takes to survive. When I left the UK um, during my farewell, it was very interesting. What I thought that I had not performed, the leadership had seen me in a different light. And my boss at my farewell said one thing, strength of character, that is what you have, Lina. Because they saw me every day coming in through summer, through winter, going through it. I stayed on crutches for one whole year. But the other thing that I also realized at that time that fuels your inner, um, in your, in your strength is a social support structure you put around you. The relationships that you have with family, friends, you know, your coaches and your mentors, I put them in that space. I had amazing friends in the UK who supported me. My family I had friends from Kenya who came to visit me, friends in the UK who would come and see me and all of them encouraged me. So every time when I felt I cannot do this, they picked me up. I must say later on when I moved to work in South Africa because I, my assignment was successful and I got appointed as a consumer director in South Africa. I worked with, a, with a, um, a coach, an executive coach. And at that point I had a bit of a hard moment because what I thought was success for me at that time, I defined my success um, around my career and what I achieved. Because of the experience, I actually, rephrased and for me success was the fact that I left the UK fully recovered and in one piece. I did not go through any mental illness. I did not go through depression and it was tough. It was by far the toughest, toughest experience. And because of that, um, I say that, you know, the inner strength because the times that I wanted to give up, the times that I felt I cannot take this anymore, 
in one of my operations, I actually then got a panic attack. I was like, I can't do this anymore. It was a very extensive um, surgery. They had to assess my mental state uh, before they operated me because of what they were going to do. And in those moments, it was that voice inside me that kept on saying, Nolina, you just need to keep going. My faith, and I was very strong. Um, I leaned on my faith a lot. And that's why I say the things that I have achieved and my inner strength comes from my faith. But I, I, my message around resilience is one of the things that does fuel your inner strength are the people that you surround yourself with. And I think that is something that um, I would urge many people to think about. What is the social support structure you have around you? Is it a structure that feeds you positively or is it one that gives you negative energy? The second thing that I have learned is your, your inner strength gives you self-belief and self-confidence. The reality is, you know, you can be put in an environment, you know, a lot of organizations today are doing a lot of initiatives around gender and inclusivity, you know, but the organizations or you can, you know, watch motivational speeches or you can talk to people, but ultimately that self-belief and that self-confidence comes from within and you must believe in your abilities and in yourself. To be honest, a lot of the successful, when we see people with a lot of inner confidence, they tend to be very, very successful because they're very sure of themselves and the way they show up with the confidence and the courage and the boldness. I think that is what deems people deem to make to that, that they are successful. But I keep saying, this is something that we all have, you know, um, inside of us. Because I think, you know, we need to ensure that, you know, we don't give ourselves self-doubt. And I'll talk about saboteurs. I think uh, some of you could have gone through these terminologies. It's becoming very, very popular, especially in talks around women. Um, and saboteurs are those voices inside us. You know, those little, little voices inside us that um, work against us. It is when you want to put yourself in and lean forward to a job and that tells you, no, you're not ready. And believe you me, even in, with all my experience, when it was come, the, when uh, the qual managing director role became vacant, because I came in first as a consultant, then as a commercial director. And um, after coming in a year later, the, the managing director role became vacant. The reality is like any other woman, I think this is a universal truth. I did not jump when I was told that am I gonna put myself um, in the race? I had to first go and talk to two mentors of mine and ask them, are you sure, am I ready? You know, I've never done the MD role. How will I do it? What do I need to think about, you know? And all of them told me, you know, um, you know, Lina, if you don't put it, what are you waiting for? I mean, they were so, so confident in my ability. Then I had a reflection with myself and I asked myself, why can't I do this role? I understand the business. I understand the things that I need to work on to be able to do the role. And the moment I started telling myself that when I went through the interviewing process, I put my best foot forward. I was clear that I had no experience but there was no, there was, I, I managed to interview without a shadow of doubt that they, I have the ability and the confidence. And even the areas that I knew that I have to pick up, supply chain, operations, manufacturing, the things that were not close to me, I knew that I could. Because that little voice in me, I didn't let it um, give me self-doubt. And when it comes to saboteurs, um, I would encourage you to watch a TED talk, which is by Shiraz. And he's done a lot of work about knowing who your inner saboteurs are. And he's actually defined nine saboteurs that you know, tend to challenge people, those little voices. And these are things like being controlling, things like being playing victim. And because of these saboteurs, we have a lot of self-doubt. And that is why I think one of the most powerful book that was written for women was by Cheryl uh, Sandberg, when she's the one of leaning in because many, many times as women, we don't lean in because we don't have self-belief and self-confidence. And I always ask myself, you know, you find a man who's 60, 40% ready, he will throw himself in the pitch. A woman 
who is, you know, 70%, 80%, still doubts her 20% instead of putting herself out there. And I think for me, this is where your inner strength comes in. That voice that tells you that you're capable, that belief in you have in yourself and your abilities, because there's so much external environments can do. You need to ultimately be the one who believes in yourself and your abilities. So my message to all of you is be careful about your saboteurs. Um, it would be good if you can look at that TED talk. And uh, I think even there's an, uh, an assessment um, he, he, he does. Um, he wrote a book on positive intelligence and it just helps you navigate around. The first thing about everything is always being aware about what your saboteurs are and then how do you manage them so that you don't, um, you actually keep positive even in moments that you would necessarily self-doubt. The last one um, is a sense of peace and calmness. Um, I have realized by leaning on my inner strength. Initially, I was a person who used to react a lot. And I've realized that, um, you know, by managing my self-strength and leaning on my self-strength, I'm able to hold back. Today, as a leader, I have come a long way on this journey of calmness. Um, even today, in uh, like earlier today, the kind of things that um, I was discussing with the team when they sit down and tell me we will not deliver what we expect. Uh, before I would jump and be spontaneous, today I'm able to manage how I react to situations. And you realize when you have the ability to hold back yourself because of your inner strength, not to react when you should, and to think through and be calm about it, you also build the skill of compassionate and forgiveness. And if you live, and if you're compassionate with yourself, you are forgiving, not only to yourself, to others, but to yourself. And when I talk about compassionate, there is when I bring in the fear of failure. One of the things that helps you accept the fear of failure is the inner strength that comes from you. You have to be comfortable with failing. I think as women, we sometimes put so much pressure on ourselves. We have to realize we are not super women. We all have our flaws. We cannot do everything at 110. And it's okay if some things give. Today, I'm very clear as an MD, I don't need to know everything. And in that clarity, I've also found peace. Um, before I believed that I needed to know everything, I needed to know, you know, and have all the answers. Today, I'm very clear. I don't need to know and have all the answers. All I need to do is to reach out to the right people, to navigate me in the right direction and to pull in the team because a lot of the answers are seated there with the team. And it is okay not to know, it is okay to fail and you have to forgive yourself. I think I, you know, um, um, uh, I attended a Live to Lead talk by uh, John Maxwell once and one of the talk, uh, the, the ladies presenting um, gave an acronym for fail as first attempt in learning. And I think we need to be able to be in that space. If you're in that space as an individual, you find peace and calmness. And I think when you find peace and calmness, you navigate through your life personally um, and professionally very well. You're able to make the calls that you need to. Um, and I think when you get into a space of forgiveness, it frees yourself from a lot of anger and distress that we sometimes give ourselves. So someone would ask me, how can you find your inner strength? For me, I say the best way to find your inner strength is to listen to yourself, to listen to what that voice inside you tells you. Does it build you or does it bring you down? If it brings you down, it's definitely a saboteur. If it gives you a lot of doubt, it's a saboteur. I think it is, it is, and I've talked about it, I think you need to surround yourself with people who give you positive energy. If you surround yourself with positive energy, you actually fuel and, and strengthen your inner strength. Um, this is where your faith also comes in um, and the belief that the, the power and the strength and your faith will carry you through um, and you're able to uplift yourself. Uh, that is what I would say. Those are the kind of things. Um, and like I said, I think when you get comfortable with certain things like failure, it makes you stronger. It makes you less fearful about 
what you will navigate, um, uh, of what you know the future holds and the adversity that would come your way. Uh, because you know you're able to 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 handle whatever comes your way, and I think you know as leaders, um, in, uh, increasingly, you know working with coaches is a big thing, um, and I really do advocate for working with coaches, because when you have challenges that you need to navigate, if you're doubting yourself on our ability um, to put yourself forward for a next role or you have something in the office and a, or a personal issue that you're dealing with, I think you, know, you need to get comfortable. And I would urge a lot of people to get comfortable in the space of working with coaches. Because what they do is that they help you just navigate. Um, the answers come from you. They don't come from, the, from them. And with that, what you're able to do is realize your full potential. Uh, so that, in my view, is one of the ways in which um, you can actually build your inner strength. So I will stop and I will uh, make reference to a last quote. Joel Austin, I think many of you know him. Um, he's a renowned uh, a pastor in one of the big um, churches in the, in the US. And he does some very, very powerful ses uh, sessions. There is one that um, I make reference to, and again, I would urge you to listen to it. It is the power of I am. It talks about the self-belief and how you wake up every morning what you tell yourself. If you tell yourself you're not capable, then those you will attract um, incidences like that. If you tell yourself you are capable and, and every, anything is possible, then you will attract opportunities that demonstrate that you are actually capable and you're able to navigate that space. So my last is to encourage you um, with this quote that we may get knocked down from the outside because that is a reality. Life will always, and I say life will throw things at you. But the key to living in victory is to learn how to get up on the inside and how you get up on the inside is tapping onto your inner strength. And is that inner strength that will bring you greatness and greatness in whatever you do. There is greatness in, it could be in your personal life, it could be in your professional life. How you define greatness is up to you. But I honestly do really believe if you too, if you tap into your inner strength, then you achieve greatness. And with that, I will ask to end my conversation there and open it up to questions. Wow, Lina, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for those insights on inner strength and very personal insights, especially, I can't imagine a whole year on crutches. I've not been on crutches, but a whole year is a long time. And I think that there is inner strength. Actually, you must have looked for inner strength and being out of the country is even more difficult. And, and, and that's, that's true inner strength. And I think I'll just pick up a few things as we wait for questions to come through. Yeah. And, and Eunice, allow me to just add questions. on to that. I actually yes. had my seventh operation uh, when COVID started. It's still a wow. journey that I'm battling with. Um, when COVID started, I had to make a choice. I was going out of the country to get treatment, but it was not possible because where I was going, there had been a COVID outbreak. So I had to. Um, decided to make a call and, and have treatment here. So on March 20th, a week after the first COVID case, I went in for my seventh surgery. My seventh for surgery. For the same accident. For the same accident. So it is a journey. It is a journey and it has been one of sheer resilience. So thank you for that acknowledgement. All right. Thanks. So, so just to sum up, um, inner strength from Lina. Resilience, that is key. Self-belief and self-confidence, sense of peace and calmness. And I think one key thing that you said, Dina, is we should not be afraid to fail. And failure is part of success. I think, I think that is very key. And I think for me, I would, I would just like to ask Lina, uh, when, the, when those uh, saboteurs come, those inner voices of, um, just telling you you can't do it. What can you say gave you 
strength or give you that what what give you that inner strength to actually especially go for the md role what yeah. actually pushed you to actually go to, to to actually take up that challenge yeah um i'll tell you the very funny thing about the md role is when i was being interviewed by the board in qual there was one of the board members who um uh, could not understand how having come and only worked in multinationals that I was ready to come and work for a local company. But um, to be honest, um, I thought through why I joined Qual. Um, I was clear that it would offer me an opportunity for general management because that was the path that I had desired. So it was intentional. Um, and when I got in and started understanding the business, I felt even more confident. And I think one of the things that has made me um, in the early days successful as an MD transitioning were two things. The fact that I was an insider, um, it does help when you get your first MD role when you understand the business. And especially in FMCGs, they are fueled by commercial. And that was is my strength. I am uh, very strong commercially. So, um, you know, as I navigate through everything else, at least I, I know that the commercial space which delivers the business numbers um, is secure. But um, 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 second to that was, you know, um, I, I just, you know, looked at myself and I said to myself, you know, um, if I don't take this next opportunity, um, I think I was also clear that I could um, leave the organization because I started feeling that um, I was almost out, out, um, outgrowing the commercial role given I had been heading marketing in 17 markets. And if you understand the BAT marketing, it's a very big role. It sits on the leadership team, on the regional space. So Qual, yes, was a, a small point. But the way I look at Qual um, was a consolidation of the things that I have learned. I have been um, blessed to work in organizations, Unilever and BAT that have trained me. So Qual for me is a consolidation of everything that I have learned uh, and an opportunity to be part of a team that is transforming an organization, leveraging on the experiences that have come. Um, uh, the second thing, um, you know, when you said, other than myself believe was actually, uh, when I reached out to my mentors, um, they had no doubt that I was ready. And sometimes, um, unfortunately, we still look for uh, external, um, uh, confirmation, it did come. And I thought if they feel that I can do it, why can't I do it? So that's what made me through it. But in but uh, ultimately the choice was mine because when you interview, you have to interview with a conviction that only comes from the belief that you can do it, especially when you're going in for a role that you have not done before. Yeah, I hope that answers you. Yes, it does, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm checking to see whether there's any question. I can't see any hand up. Please feel free to put your hand up also and ask a question. It doesn't have to be on the chat. So maybe, maybe Lina, then I'll ask another question. How important is it to have mentors? And mm. as a lady, would you recommend we have women, mentors, men? What, yeah. what have you had mentors that you didn't feel did not direct you in the right path but yeah. like what i've just had you say is that your mentors actually are the ones who told you you're ready and probably mm. you are not thinking you're ready how important is it to have uh, a mentor and how mm. how do you look for the right mentor for your role yeah. or your level or, or or whatever level you're at i think you know um i'm a true believer in mentorship I think I have benefited in my journey because of the mentors that I've had, you know? Um, and whenever the question is asked about mentors, for me, male or female, it's not ethnic. I mean, a good mentor is someone who um, you learn from because what is mentorship is learning from someone else's experience. So the first thing is looking at the mentor and saying, what value would they add for you? If I am in the, in the MD path, today I purpose to surround myself with the mentors who have been managing directors and have led organizations. Because when I have a challenge and I lean on them a lot, I ask, 
you know, what would I do about this? What do I do about that? You know, what has your experience do? And they help you because they share the experience that you have. But that said, I think I always say there has to be some sort of chemistry, you know? Um, so it's not about whether male or female is, is the chemistry right? Because it is uh, a relationship that like any other and a relationship to be successful is, 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 is founded on trust. So there has to be the trust um, there has to be the belief that this person will add value to you. So most of the times when you pick a mentor, um, sometimes if you're in an organization, you can get one. Um, it can be a line manager and there's no necessarily doesn't work for you. It can be someone that you reach out to. It can be someone that you've worked with before. So I, I don't say there is a fast and uh, uh, I mean, there is one size fits all. There are different ways in which you can get a mentor. A lot of my mentors, are people that have worked with me and people that have met uh, in my journey of life, right? Thank you. Okay, we have uh, several questions. One from Elizabeth. She says, thank you so much, Lina. A question, what routine did you have to adjust to for you to manage your role at Qual effectively? Yeah. Can I give you two? I'm seeing three. Yeah. There's another one from... From Audrey, um, how did you deal with the evil DJ or negative internal voices? And how you changed mentors? Ah, have you changed men mentors as you have grown? I mm. think, yeah, maybe you can that you can you can okay. answer those two first. The first one was how I managed my role, yeah. Yeah. Um yes. I must say the 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 uh, the first thing I did as I uh, when I transitioned from uh, being the commercial director to the managing director, I worked with a coach, a coach who is skilled as helping leaders transition from uh, to, to, to leadership and especially leadership where it's business leadership. Because it really does change. When you're a functional head, you're a functional head. But when you're the MD, the back starts and stops with you. And that's the first thing you need to put your mind uh, yourself in that mindset that you know you are actually at the lead people are looking up to you and you as a leader have to play certain rules you have to inspire you have to provide the vision and the direction you have to teach because part of the the leader's role is to teach you know you you have talked about selling and and um and of course you know ultimately there is the delivery of the results so the first thing I had to do was let go of, um, especially for me was purposed, I purpose to let go of anything commercial because it is very natural when you're in a new space to lean on what you know. And what I knew was a commercial space. So I made it very clear that I will not get involved at the level that I will on commercial, whether there's a crisis or not. And then I purposed to actually spend more time on the aspects of the business that I was not conversant with, because this is something that I had talked about when I was doing, you know, working with my coach. The other thing I talked about a lot with my coach is what do I want my legacy to be? Because I do not want, you know, I want when um, four years are over or five years and it's time for me to move on, that I look back. Um, so with that coaching, I also identified the things that I had to do. So there was a lot of coaching I did around me, the leader, and the kind of paradigms and shifts that I have to do from me, Lina, the commercial director to the MD. So that uh, coaching session helped me tremendously. And I kept her um, for, we did coaching sessions for about six months into the role. And then I felt I was confident in time to navigate. So today um, I always make reference to the coaching actions that I had um to actually you know when i lose focus you know because sometimes you do lose focus um to reset i always make reference to that um the second is dealing with the evil dj those are the saboteurs um for me you know um, um the reality is you will have the saboteurs um like i said and especially in my current space um i have also uh, purposed because my current saboteurs would be anything around me not being able to do what I do well because I'm not that experienced you know those are the things can I do this COVID has come will I be able to navigate the business 
and I have um, created a safe space um, um, around me. I have a very dear friend of mine who is an MD as well. And um, uh, between her and the two mentors that I'm currently leaning on, I actually use them a lot because when I have the doubts, which to me is that evil DJ, I lean back to them and you know I have conversation with them. And with those conversations, I'm able to steer myself back on what I think is the right path, yeah. But the, to be honest, the saboteurs will always be there. Um, and, and they have saboteurs that I am working on, you know, um, continuously uh, working on. Um, and, and part of the Women Development uh, Leadership Program, um, we spent a lot of time with uh, saboteurs and you did an assessment. So I'm very clear what my saboteurs are. Um, I tend to be a very controlling leader. And that's something that I've had to work on and, and how it manifests itself and what I need to do differently to deal with the saboteurs so that they don't influence me um, negatively. So I've learned to let go. And that was a big one. When you are used to managing and controlling things, to let go is not easy. So that is how I, I manage. But it's, um, it's a continuous journey. It's, I haven't reached there, but um, I, I think I am making progress, yeah. Thank you. Well answered. Um, I can see a hand up. I'll allow Miriam to ask her question. Miriam. Thank you, Eunice. I hope you can hear me. Thank you, Lena, yes. for sharing your wonderful journey. It, it, it's vulnerable to share your story. And, and that's why I think, you know, you deserve to be thanked. Thank you. I, you spoke about um, seeking external validation at some mm -hmm. point in your career. And as a woman who serves on a couple of boards, I do know that women um, go through a phase at the beginning when you're always uh, seeking external validation uh, because maybe you have been given a responsibility, you have been requested to chair this committee or the other. And sometimes we don't have that, um, like you said, a man will have 30% um, will be 30% as good, but they'll still throw in their heart in the ring. So I don't know what you would say to this forum about seeking external validation and mm. how that works well, especially mm. when you're transitioning to board leadership or just serving on a board. What would you say about that? Yeah. Um, I must say, you know, um, uh, that's, a very, uh, that's a very good question. And I think it's something that uh, is, is like you mentioned, is, is, is been discussed a lot. Um, but I think everyone has, and you know, I, I always answer based on what uh, my experience, I think everyone has, um, I think the reality of us as women and everyone as well inherently is the external validation, yeah? But I think it's what do you do with that external validation and how do you, uh, when you get valid, uh, val uh, validated, whether positively or negatively, how do you let that impact you? So I have uh, no negative views around listening to validation. There are people who you will, because one of the ways of getting into boards, um, and I think um, uh, the last talk we had with um, uh, 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 John Gumbi, uh, Gumi, he's, he mentioned it about people seeking him out and saying, you know, I'm ready for a board. Can you help me? Can you do that? So the external validation is important because I think it's important that you're clear about why you want to get into the board and the value that you will bring to the board. And sometimes you need that validation from someone. Do they see the value that you're bringing the way you see it? And I think that is where um, uh, probably um, I would say is, is, is where the validation relevance would come in. Um, but other than that, you know, um, it is, in my view, um, unfortunately, a reality that people do seek uh, uh, validation and with, with boards being like any other task is the same thing. But for me, I think it's urging we seek validation to, so, to know whether you will be a fit and whether you will bring the, the value that you think will, you will bring will actually be perceived that way. Because if it's not, then there will be a mismatch. And chances are, even if you know, in today's world where people 
are interviewing for them, you will not necessarily be um, uh, shortlisted or successful. So I think the validation is positive. It will help you steer and give you direction in the way to go. That's what I would say. I hope that has answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Thanks, Lena. Uh, we have three other questions. And Lena, feel free to invite uh, Marion, who is with us. <laughs> Welcome, Marion. And Marion. Wamboi, Mbesa, <laughs> to, to support you in any of the questions, eh? to give them an opportunity to say I do. Exactly. So um, there's a question from Caroline. When do you leverage on coaching mm -hmm. as opposed to mentorship? Can you do both at the same time? That's one question. And another question, is there a measure is there a measure to how many mentors one can have? Uh, those are related. And then I think there's one more. So um, they say that, who is this? This is RISPA. They say that it's lonely at the top, <laughs> is it? And how do you navigate that? So I think you can take those three and please feel free to invite any of the other two ladies to support yeah. you. I think a lot, and uh, I hope I'll remember all those questions. Um, when I was going to talk to coaching, I was going to talk about lonely at the top. Um, let me start with that. Is it lonely? Yes, the cliche, it is lonely. And you do feel lonely, but it shouldn't need, it doesn't need to be lonely at the top. It's only lonely at the top if you don't have a support structure or lean on a support structure to help you. Um, I think, you know, I used to also say it's lonely at the top, but that's when I realized actually it is not lonely. Maybe you are there in the business alone, um, but you have a support structure around you. So you don't need to feel lonely because um, whatever challenges you do, you have, if you have a support structure, then it, it is not, shouldn't be lonely. And that talks to the question around coaching and how I use coaching and how I use mentorship. Um, I use coaching when I want to navigate around um, personal issues that I want to deal with, things like leadership. Um, if I have done a leadership assessment or, or an assessment of that, and I've seen some, um, some things that I want to unpack and, um, and resolve um, that I think will help me become a more effective leader, so I tend to lean on coaching a lot um, on matters leadership. Um, that is my experience. Mentorship, I do mentorship to help me uh, on my day job. You know, when I want advice and to pick someone's mind on a challenge that I'm having in the business. So business challenges as the MD and the things that I want to do. Um, so work related, when I say work business related stuff, I, I lean on mentorship. Um, uh, work uh, personal things around leadership, around the, you know, me and building myself as a leader, you know, that whole self personal development, I lean on, um, on coaching. That's what I do. Um, so um, again, Rispa, is it lonely? Yes and no. Yeah. But uh, sometimes it does feel lonely, um, but uh, it doesn't need to. I think uh, you talked about Marion, where is Marion? Marion is one of the people that we share a lot um, because she's also walked that journey. Uh, so that's part of um, my support group um, is someone and you know, she, I know she's in this forum and you've mentioned her. So, and that's what we do. We uplift each other. We share, you know, if you have a challenge uh, because that's what men do all the time. Huh? Um, and as women, we need to leverage on our networks and make sure that they work for us, you know, and that's what, you, what you're doing is not strange to anything. So is there a boys club, not a boys club? You know, it's that kind of discussion. But for me, I don't look at it this way. I say, can you leverage on your networks and your relationships to, to assist you? Because you cannot, and I keep saying, it starts from the premise that you cannot know everything, yeah? Thank you. And uh, how many, I think, how many mentors one can have? Wow. Well, um, I've found that, uh, you know, uh, more than two at a time becomes for me too much because you need to commit the time um, to have the conversations and to really leverage on the relationship. So given, um, if I think of uh, 
you know, my work schedule and the rules, I mean, and my, my home schedule, I find two at any time. So I will, so I have, let's say like four mentors, but um, at any one time I'm leaning on about two of them because I find that it always helps to have two different perspectives um, on whatever, and especially since I use them for work issues. If I have a work related um, issue or, or thought that I want to bounce off them, I tend to want to look at at least two because with that I get two perspectives and then I'm able to make um, what I think is the right decision. Um, to steer me in the right direction. Okay, just and and just um, still on the same um, from Yvonne. Um, thanks, Lina. Would you say that a mentor can become a sponsor when it comes to fronting one for a position? Yeah, I think so. I think a good mentor can also double heart as a sponsor. Because a mentor is, you know, because of your relationship, your mentor gets to know you very well. Um, and the kind of conversations you'll have, they will be able to know you, um, you know, your ins and outs, your, your strengths, your ambitions. So if they're in a position to play a role of sponsoring you, um, let's say, especially in the work environment, into a role or a board. And I think the sponsoring really does. Because um, like I said, um, I've always said I don't have time for boards. And yes, the rules that I've had have been very demanding. But one of the things that I am purposing, I turned 50 um, this year in January, and I, I keep saying I'm on my second act. And part of the things that I want to do going forward is things around impact. And for me, things around impact, the board sits right in there. So one of the things I have to is start sitting on boards, whether I have the time, I will create the board, the time. Um, I just need to understand how many I can. I think I just need to get on with one because I do sit on the qual one. Um, so I'm hoping that I'll be able to do that. And I'm hoping uh, when I get there, the part of the people that I will talk to are my mentors so that they can, because some of them have the ability to double hat as a sponsor. So I do agree a mentor can be a sponsor. Thank you. And then probably uh, let's let's do a last one from Wathaya. Um, Lina, looking back, what would you tell the 33-year-old Lina in terms of building your board career? <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, what would I tell my 33-year-old? Um, uh, the reality is at 33, you're not thinking of board positions. I think even the other day we had a question from a lady who was talking about putting herself out there for boards. And um, the response is, um, is um, that you're too young. But what I would tell my 33-year-old self is, and the conversation I would have with her is the skills that she needs to start developing and building as she's navigating through her life in her 30s, uh, you know, 30s of discovery, um, and so are the 40s and the 50s, I must say, are very awesome because right now you're very sure of yourself. And I think that also helps with uh, inner strength. So I would tell my 33-year-old self to start working for certain aspects um, to prepare herself for boards. Uh, and in hindsight, probably I wouldn't have waited too long. I would have just gotten into the ring a bit early, but um, I don't believe, I don't regret, but uh, I would uh, just tell her to prepare herself um, as she navigates through and steers through life, you know, be it her personal life and um, especially her working career to prepare herself for boards and when she's, uh, and not to shy away from throwing herself into the ring. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Marion, what did you say to your 33 year old self? I think it's good to hear from Ma Marion also <laughs> and say hi to us. Thank you for joining us. Hi. Thank you. Even, if, good evening, everybody. What a beautiful good story, evening. Lina. Um, I, I can't take anything from, uh, I can't add anything to what Lina has said. Uh, when we were 33, we didn't really think that we would get to the point where we would consider boards, uh, but but we are we are. Look at what's happening uh, in in our space. We are on the table and we are here to stay. Absolutely. So the more the more we believe in our in ourselves, the better it is for us. 
and I totally agree with with her mentoring philosophy, her coaching philosophy, and just to see her today sharing so authentically is such a beautiful thing. It's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. And and um, one of the things that Lina and I agree on is that be generous with what you know mm. and be generous with um, what you're experiencing as an MD or as, as an executive. And here it is, Lina being very generous and being very open about um, what doubts she has and what confidences she has and being, you know, beautiful and awesome at 50. Really, really nice, really great. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Marion. Thank you for that. Thank you, thank you, Marion. So Lina, um, maybe any parting shots uh, before I, I, I give um, a few more announcements and a yeah. vote of thanks? Um, I think my parting shot is um, to encourage all the women out there to lean on your inner strength. We all have it. We, um, and if you lean on that strength, yeah, you will be amazed at the kind of things that you can achieve. And let me use the word greatness. I think you will achieve nothing um, but greatness. Um, and um, I'd like to thank the women on Boards Network for making me get out of my comfort zone and having this conversation. So thank you for, for having me and thank you all everyone for, for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lina. So just besides question, there are a lot of comments that have come in uh, from, from, our, from the participants here. Thank you, excellent, awesome, authentic. I think you'll read them from the recording. Um, I mean, they're great comments. We, we, we really appreciate of how you've done this so simply and you've brought out such key um, facts that we need to take out, take away with us. And, and, and we say, thank you for your faith too. I think you brought something very important. Something that keeps you going is your faith. And, and that's, very, that, that's very important. So for me is to say thank you, Lina, and thank you for everyone for taking time to actually join us uh, in this board talk session, Inner Strength for Greatness. And I would just like to highlight a few more events that are coming up on 12th of June. Uh, we have a breakfast and round table, and then we have um, board profiling and personal positioning. As we said, we do trainings. So that's a very good one coming up on 5th and 8th of July. So those are the upcoming events. So maybe you can diarize that. And for those who are not members, I think we've put it on the chat, how you can join. There's a form you can fill. And then the secretariat will actually communicate with you directly. For me is to say thank you also to Hannah, and Agnes and Kantai, the secretariat that has put this together. And for the women on boards, founders and the board that has enabled us to actually reach out to you, Lina and many other speakers that we've had in the past. Uh, we thank all of them and actually say thank you to all of you and to probably close with um, quotes as, 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 as Lina has given us quite a number. And I'll give you one from Mariah Carey. She actually doesn't sing only. I got one about strength from her. It says, you really have to look inside yourself and find your own inner strength and say, say this to yourself, I am proud of what I am and whom I am. I think that's, that's, that's something that is quite strong and it resonates with actually what we've gone through. So find that inner strength and believe in yourself and be proud, look at yourself and say, I can do this. And I think for me, Lina, today you've given me um, some strength. I need to look for that inner strength. There's a position I've been saying I won't apply for. I think it's time. It's, it's time, time to do that. It's time. Yeah. So, so thank you all. And uh, we've come to the end of this session. For me is to say thank you and to pray, to pray blessings upon you and to have a great uh, 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 evening, uh, the rest of the evening, and, and, and have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.